yeah, I'm not a marketing person. I, I don't understand many of the choices that we make, but I, whoever coined Copilot as the thing for Microsoft, they had a very good day. That's exactly how I think about this current wave of technology is uh, there are this kind of extension of your brain that can help you do things that it would have maybe been practical to do otherwise. And, uh, but there's, while still factoring kind of human ingenuity in the picture. Hi, I'm Boaz, founder and CEO of Simply Augmented, and I'm excited that you're tuning in to Shift AI, a show that explores what it takes to thrive and adapt to the changing workplace in the digital age of remote work and AI. In today's episode, I'm thrilled to have Pablo Castro as our guest. Pablo is a distinguished engineer at Microsoft and has spent his career working on numerous Microsoft product teams and is currently one of the leaders at the forefront of innovation, working on Azure AI Search. If you're someone interested in the way that AI is developing at one of the key companies in the AI ecosystem, you're not going to want to miss this episode. We also want to send out a special thank you to CIBC Innovation Bank and Simply Augmented for sponsoring this episode. This is going to be a great show, and we're super excited to have Pablo on today. We can't wait to learn from him. Let's get to it. All right, Pablo. It is great to have you on Shift AI. Excited to talk to you today. There's a lot to cover, and it's great to have you. It's great to be here. Thanks for the opportunity. Yeah, of course, of course. So, you know, I want to start talking about your background just to kind of level set for the audience. Uh, you've spent the majority of your career at Microsoft, but you studied in, in Argentina. And as I look at your career, I mean, you started as program manager and technical manager, you've made your way all the way to the top. Now you're a distinguished engineer. Can you just talk a little bit about that journey? And you've been there for more than 20 years and you've done so many things. Help the audience just kind of understand where you sit and what you're working on today that you're excited about. Yeah, it's been a long time. So yeah, I mean, the, the journey has been fascinating. You know, it started, as you said, at Microsoft more than 20 years ago. Uh, before that, I worked in a couple of roles in Argentina as well. Um, you know, at Microsoft, we first came for a year or two. We were like, well, let's see how it is to work at Microsoft and live in the US. You know, we were living in a different country. And then we'll go do something else. That was kind of the plan. And, uh, yeah. and uh, you blink and it's 20 years. You know, part of it is I kept finding interesting things to do at Microsoft. One of the interesting things about these big companies is, particularly in this kind of technology space, is you, there is always something going on. So no matter what you're curious about at any point in time, you'll find someone working on that. So you can join them or start something. So yeah, that, that has kept me around. And I still love it because the same effect kind of keeps happening today. Frankly, I also, I love the area. I grew up in a big city. I liked the big city, but I had I feel I had enough of that. So now I live near kind of the main Redmond campus of Microsoft and very different area, but I really love I love the green and I love the outdoors as well. Going back to Argentina a little bit, when you grew up, were you always into computers from a young age and were your parents also into computers? How did you get to the university and get so passionate about studying computing? Yeah, I would say I took a few detours, but I look back, I, I this was going to what I was going to do uh, for sure. I, so when I was Maybe my parents bought me a first computer, a Commodore 64, uh, that uh, tells you how old I am. And I always say, you know, with my parents, this was kind of the, one of the highest leveraged investments we, we could have made. Uh, you know, I'm very grateful for that. So they weren't uh, kind of computer science uh, folks. Uh, my, mom was a, my, my mom was a nurse and my dad was sales. But they, they always encouraged us to, I have two other brothers, and they always encouraged us to, to go be curious and yeah. gave us the tools that they could give us for that. And I would say buying that computer was a very good move. So up yeah, to that, absolutely. I studied other things, like I studied electronics for a good chunk of my kind of studying time before I went into computer science, but it was clear that I was going to end in this space. Yeah. Well, I, I always like to ask this question. I, I know that you're kind of mildly embarrassed about the title, a uh, distinguished engineer, but it's a pretty amazing title at Microsoft and so, but I wonder your first job, like what was the first job back in Buenos Aires that you actually got paid? Oh, it's, it's a great idea. I, a great question. I mean, I can think of two kind of first was the first one I ever got paid for coding anything, which was kind of a freelance, a freelance deal. Like oh. I had this friend that they found someone that needed like a TV station that they needed like a piece of software for managing news and things like that. We overdid it by so much because it was this, you know, we felt we had to do it right. And so we put so much energy on that. 
And then a couple of years later, I started in this company called Sysdam back in Argentina. It was a consulting company where you do a little bit of everything. And it was a great way to start because it gave me a flavor of what does it look like to build applications of any kind? Like, you know, customers, these companies are like, they'll sell anything to any of the customers yeah. in terms of soft, custom software. So it, it kind of it exposes you to all kinds of different scenarios and whatnot. And it was also an opportunity to work in the application layer. Like most of my career after that, I, I built system, like I'm in the systems layer. I built databases or you know, search engines or whatnot. But I, that experience on building actual apps, being at the top of the stack, was uh, very formative to give me a flavor of what it looked like to solve the actual kind of last mile of a business problem. Yeah. Well, you know, it's funny. I, I want to dig into kind of what you're doing now. I know that you're deep in Azure, open AI. You're dealing a lot with databases. I first came across you when you were doing some presentations and build talking about GPT-3 and about the way that was interfacing with Azure open AI. And I mean, it seems like ages ago that we're talking about GPT-3, but tell me a little bit about like what you're doing today that is bringing you energy and uh, how you're interfacing in the AI world. Yeah, so today I'm spending a lot of time kind of at the intersection of, of these language models and uh, knowledge. So kind of the question that we, we tackle like with my team is in a world where you have these language models that are effectively reasoning engines that they are very clever, but they don't know about the stuff that you need them to know about. And we have lots of data, but it's separated from these models. How do you put them together? And uh, so that intersection is, I think it's critical in terms of applying all this fascinating technology to business problems. Uh, and it's also, frankly, a lot of fun because kind of it mixes these language modeling problems with knowledge representation problems. And how do we integrate these things? And how do we take advantage of the, of the strengths of each of these pieces of technology? So we've been spending a lot of time in that space. And you know, concretely, we do things like you know, work on things like GBT and also things like vector databases and kind of retrieval systems, things like that. So you know, when a lot of people think about vector databases like Cognitive Search or Pinecone and things like that, they think about proprietary data. So th this audience is uh, made up of a lot of business people that are wondering, how practically do I take advantage of Gen AI in my everyday business? So when you think about the work that you do around knowledge, what does that mean to you? And can you provide some, uh, some practical examples for how this could show up for businesses? Yeah. So let me start with an example, and then maybe we'll come back into how, how these things work. Yeah. So a simple example is if you have, say, M365, I still want to say Office. We have Office, <laughs> and you have the Office Copilot, the M365 Copilot, then uh, you can ask it. Not only questions you would ask to say GPT or something like that, but you can also ask questions that require knowledge, knowing about your documents or your calendar or your email to answer them. And uh, of course, you have to opt into that. You have to give permission. But if you do, then you can say, hey, like, you know, what is my day today? Or do, do I have a meeting with this customer? And if I do, uh, what do I need to be prepared for it? What documents should I read? Or can you give me a summary of the document? And without even realizing that you cross this line where maybe you're asking a question that is kind of pure like logic question. It's like something that the model may know on its own from its training data. But then all of a sudden you're asking questions that require externalized, externalized knowledge, like you know, your calendar or your email or your documents are not part of the model. And the goal yeah. of these systems is to blend that. So you don't really see as a user, you don't see a scene. What you see is that the model will pull data from whatever it needs to pull data as long as you allow it and answer the question. So in terms of mechanics, what that means is you have to have Again, your email changes every minute, so or your documents or whatever. So you have to have a, these two pieces. You have to have access to a language model like GPT that can do all the reasoning and decide where to look for the data, and then after reading the data, formulate an answer for you. But then you need a retrieval system that can actually go dig around. And to your question of how do I bring my own business kind of proprietary data, then just like the my M365 Copilot accesses its data, in this case, using the Microsoft Graph, there is this kind of emergence of tools that and kind of underlying kind of systems that allow you to take whatever data you're, you, you manage. Maybe it's documents, maybe it's data of other nature, maybe it's manuals or troubleshooting guides or you know, anything else. Load them into one of these knowledge-based systems, like, you know, like Azure AI Search is the one I work on, and, and then kind of hook that up to the language model so that together they can work to answer questions. Yeah, that's amazing. And so I, I guess as people think about like, what is the knowledge that I really rely on every day, you know, that's changing a lot. Yeah. So you might have 
CRMs of some sort, a HubSpot, a Salesforce, a Dynamics, of, you know, and it's constantly changing with new notes and meetings and meeting transcripts and all of that. And being able to tap into that, you know, maybe I'm walking into a meeting and I can pull up my phone and say, oh, this is the last meeting that I had. This is what I need to know for this meeting and so on. That's a simplistic example, but that's the kind of idea that just happens in real time so quickly and it's invisible, but that's what's happening behind the scenes. That's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. So, you know, as, as you think about, and maybe we can get a little bit more technical, like what are some of the things that are really exciting you right now about the potential for large language? I mean, things are moving so fast yeah. compared with you know where we were last year. You know, as you look ahead and you think about like what's going to become available, and, you know, what comes to mind for you that you can kind of tease for the audience? Yeah, so much going on uh, these days. So hard, hard to pick, but uh, like a few examples. One is we're seeing models with much longer context length. Those are, I guess, that what that means is you can stuff a lot more data and context and instructions in, in, in each question you ask the model. Um, that opens more, more and more scenarios that would have been tricky a while back. We're also seeing these models go be faster. And uh, that sounds mundane in a world where what's fascinating is like the depth in reasoning and whatnot. But um, ultimately, the ability to do this at a reasonably uh, fast pace enables us to have these real-time conversations. And today, many of the decisions we make about how deep we go maybe on a question or automatically solving a problem is constrained by how quickly we can get back to the user. So speed is yeah. maybe fundamental in enabling the scenario that it may be ready in, any other di- in every other mm-hmm. dimension, but it needs the, the, the performance side. And so I think that's going to be an important element as well. And then, you know, we're also seeing uh, an increased, increasing level of sophistication on retrieval systems. Like, you know, how deep do you go into your knowledge base to retrieve the right bits of information? Where, you know, we saw a beginning that was kind of uh, very direct. Hey, like, I'm going to ask a question. I'm going to just find facts related to that question and try to formulate yeah. an answer. And now we see these very sophisticated systems that they go back and forth between the language model and the retrieval system. The language model sometimes kind of reflects about the answer and it's like, no, that's not what I meant. Find me this other thing. And uh, you can watch this play out and it's fascinating to see this literal conversation between the parts of the system. And now before we go further into the interview, I want to take a minute to talk about one of our show's sponsors, CIBC, and their new podcast, CIBC Innovation Banking. As we all know, it's hard to get funding in unpredictable markets, and that's why it's more important than ever to work with trusted partners who have connections beyond cash. On the new season of the CIBC Innovation Banking podcast, experienced venture capitalists and entrepreneurs share the surprising trends they see driving growth in the innovation economy and tips to obtain funding. Because when it comes to securing funding, people matter more than projections. Whether you're seed stage or late stage, CIBC Innovation Banking helps entrepreneurs and investors grow startups into market leaders. Discover the CIBC Innovation Banking podcast and learn from the innovators of today, the market leaders of tomorrow, and those who fund them. Tune in on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Now back to the episode. I want to go deeper on that because one of the things that come up when I present to people and talk about rag and talk about retrieval is hallucination. And it's been all over the news. And it's, you know, something that people have on their minds, especially non-technical people. How do you prevent the system from not hallucinating as much? How do you increase accuracy? So from your perspective, how does that work exactly? There are a number of ways to approach the problem. Now, when it comes in particular to most business contexts or application data contexts where you have a language model and some knowledge base, then the most effective thing to do is to make sure that the, the model is grounding its answers on the data that you're providing. So kind of paraphrasing yeah. your instructions would say something along the lines of only answer based on the information that I'm providing here. Of course, the model can also not follow your instructions. So there are multiple ingredients to this. One is start by providing grounding data and ask the model to only use it. Second, make sure that when you involve the user in this process, like this is not a kind of a computer only thing where you provide an answer or you solve the problem or whatever the task that you're tackling, 
And then you provide the grounding information as part of the answering, whatever is the right UI for the experience you're building, so that the user consuming the answer knows how the information is ground- grounded I and mean, what are the data points that took the model to make uh, this decision or give you this answer. And then lastly, I would say evaluation, formal evaluation is fundamental to these systems. Like we all see these quick demos, they're, they're you know, easy to build where you just kind of mix a model and a retriever. That's a great way to learn, but I would encourage folks not to ship that. Uh, like that's the same as shipping code without unit tests. They work great yeah. as a learning process, but once you're ready to take it to the next level and have users use it, you want unit tests. And the same way you want an evaluation system that among other things can measure the groundedness of the answers. And you know, there's a lot of fascinating work done in this space where you, know, you say, well, how do you know that it's grounded? Because I mean, the model could say, I grounded it in these data points and that can be a lie too. So, yeah, totally. So there is all these emerging techniques, including using other language models for those who want strong language models like GPT-4 to actually mm-hmm. evaluate how you're doing relative to the, to how you're doing in your answers relative to the grounding information. So is it true that it's grounded on that? Is there enough overlap in information between the answer and the grounding yeah. data points yeah. and so on? So you kind of have one large language model checking to see if the other large language model yeah. is lying. Exactly. Which is, you know, who would have thought? <laughs> yeah, no, who would have thought? So, you know, is it fair to say that a lot of the hallucination examples that we're hearing out there are hallucinating on general knowledge, on the knowledge that the model has been trained on, not on confined proprietary knowledge of that business. It sounds like if I can really focus the answers on the proprietary knowledge and say, Hey, don't use general knowledge until I tell you that could fix a lot of the problems. Is that fair? Yeah, that's fair. Like I think as a generalization, that's exactly the point is like, if you ask general questions and you're not grounded on the answers, then you get what you get from the model. And these systems are complex. And so it's hard to tell where the information came from. If you ground the information on concrete data, then the situation is much better. Now, I, I mean, of course, to some extent, this kicks the problem a little forward because now you have to make sure that the grounding information you provided to the model is the right information. Because if you ground it on the wrong of data, course. then the model will faithfully answer uh, with whatever facts you provided to it, which may themselves be wrong. And you know, sometimes wrong is just plain wrong. And sometimes there's more nuance to it. Like what if they are outdated or, you know, there was last week's contract, but this week there was this addendum that I didn't know about. So all that nuance uh, needs to be accounted for uh, when it comes to, you know, making sure that the model doesn't speculate uh, with its own knowledge, but also that the knowledge is using to, to ground the information on is, uh, or ground the answer on is, uh, is the right information. You know, it's kind of interesting when we talk to businesses, we say like a new job has been created and that is knowledge manager and making sure that the information that you have in your business is really good and it's not old and it's clean and so on. It seems like today it's even more true. The minute that you point a large language model at a, at a knowledge a management system like that, it becomes critical. How do you talk to your customers about that? How do you think about that? Is that just obvious to you guys that we can't have garbage going into the system? Yeah, I don't think it's obvious. Like I wouldn't call it obvious in the sense of, you know, what's fascinating about this whole space is there are no experts. I mean, yes, some of us have been working on this for the last, what, like two years or something. There's, there's no, or actually maybe less. So there are no experts. There, there's just yeah. a lot of us trying really hard. So, so I wouldn't say it's obvious, but yes, it certainly takes energy. Like I, I like uh, your point of way, who owns, who owns the responsibility of managing your knowledge. And this, you know, this spans a wide spectrum from do you have the day, the right data and it's fresh and whatnot to what is the right data representation? This entire problem space of information representation that matters a lot because you know, different scenarios need uh, different representations of the same data sometimes. And then there is like an entire aspect of, uh, kind of policy and management in terms of, well, are you sure that the right people can see the right data? And you know, whether yeah. you are doing like classical kind of search style discovery of the data, or if you're using a very modern kind of language model-based generative AI application, the underlying rules hold. Like, you know, there is some data that in a given organization that some people can see and some people, some data that they should not see and different groups can see different data. And that needs to be equally enforced, except that now there are no standalone pieces of data, like a document or something you would hand over. It's more of the grounding information needs to be managed. So yes. I think that's another dimension along with the kind of the representation aspects and the kind of freshness that they all need to be kind of combined. I mean, to your point, into an overall management strategy 
for the data that you use to power these experiences. Yeah, I like the way that you think about that. All right, I want you to put your Microsoft hat on for a second okay. because one of the things I was excited about was that you know this is the first Microsoft uh, employee on the show. Hey. Yeah, we've had Amazon on the show, and so yeah, so a lot of pressure. No, but you know, I, I wanted to kind of just talk a little bit about some of the things that you are uh, hearing about at the company, some of the directions that you guys are going that you think are interesting, and how you know you see it as uh, as a market leader in the AI space. Yeah, happy to talk about that. So at first, I would say you know the last I don't know it's a blur eighteen months maybe a little longer I have been fascinating in terms of you know so many of our customers are doing things with Azure OpenAI and Azure AI Search and the rest of the Azure AI platform. So we got to learn a ton from people taking this technology and use it for you know real problems, real business priorities. So that has been uh, fascinating, but also it's been a learning opportunity. It's very humbling when all these people are excited about the thing that you're offering and then they go try use it. And they're like, well, we couldn't because this didn't work or this is not what I thought or whatnot. So sure. we, we're in this very tight learning loop right now where uh, you know we, we you know, work with folks, see what works and what doesn't, and then try to improve things. So a few things that we're doing, just to kind of mention a couple of examples, you know, one space is how do we lower friction? There is, you know, as I said before, there are no experts. A lot of this is new and, uh, and there is a lot of nuance to make them, making them work reasonably well. We have experience because we were lucky to do things like, you know, M365 Copilot and Bing uh, Chat, which is now the, co the Microsoft Copilot, uh, where we developed muscle early on things like what is the responsible AI approach to this so we can do this responsibly. How do we ground information well? Like all these things that uh, we had to learn, and now we can help our customers with this. So for example, the work we've done in Azure AI Studio is very much centered on how do we help you create an end-to-end -end experience that deals with uh, acquiring the data, preparing the data for these particular types of scenarios, dealing with how you prompt the model, how do you make sure the uh, results are good, and uh, how do you interact with knowledge bases? So. That has been kind of lowering the bar of entry has been, I would say, one of our priorities. And then the other one that has been, I would say, a 2024 kind of shift was, if I look at 2023, I feel it was, it was the year of demos and proofs of concept, where this was so new. All of us wanted to see what it felt like to build one of these things, and everyone took their business problem and gave it a try. It was clear 2024 yeah. is the year all these things are going to production. So, so the challenges shift from, hey, how do I get this off the ground and try one or the other thing to how do I do this securely? How, how do I know that this integration is going to work well over time? And some of the things that maybe closer to the space of work on has been interesting was it has been scale. You know, you build a prototype. As, uh, you, you can take a small retrieval system, small language model, try it all. It can get a sense of what's going to do. But then you go like, okay, we're loving this. Let's head the, Let's get the whole company on it, or let's get our entire operations on it. And you go yeah. like, well, we're going to add multiple orders of magnitude in scale. And uh, what does that mean for the systems that are powering these? And do they scale the way you think they will and whatnot? That has been an area where, you know, I, I always feel, I always think about the things we can do for our customers to remove problems for them so that they can think about the, the things only they can do because they have the context of their own business. And, and things like, you know, for example, scaling vector databases or, or giving you more predictable throughput on the language model are exactly the types of things that Microsoft as a platform can do. So you never have to think about, are you going to have enough token, I don't know, quota in your language model? Yeah. Or will your vector database grow too big? Like those are problems that we can just make disappear from you. And we're working on, on those. And now before we dive deeper, I want to take a quick moment and tell you a little bit about one of our podcast partners. As a listener of this show, I know you're trying to stay on top of all things AI and tech, which is why you have to check out the amazing GeekWire podcast, produced by GeekWire and hosted by Todd Bishop. It's a treasure of insights featuring industry leaders and the latest tech trends that are shaping our world, and the perfect companion podcast to shift AI. GeekWire podcast is where technology meets curiosity and covers the world of technology, startups, and geek culture. Expand your tech horizons and join the conversation. Tune into the GeekWire podcast today. A perfect complement to our own discussions here. Don't miss out. Follow the GeekWire podcast on Apple Podcast, Spotify, or your favorite listening app. Now back to the episode. 
I think another thing that people think about when they think about uh, Microsoft, but also AWS as well as security, you know, they feel secure when they put their applications on there. In the context of AI, there is a lot of fear in the public. How do you talk about security when businesses come to you and say, hey, is this going to be secure if I throw a lot of information at these large language models? That's a great question. I, I would maybe, uh, I would split that into two. There is security from the information management standpoint. And then there is the, well, where does this data go in terms of I, I'm asking these language models all these questions. So they are seeing my questions. Right? Like, is that okay yeah. to do? So in terms of information management, this is an area where we talked about this a little bit before, but this is an area where I feel Microsoft and to be fair, like the other cloud providers, we've had a lot of uh, experience on fundamentals of data management. Like in Microsoft in particular, we have an extensive kind of governance platform that has been in place because we need it for other things like, you know, analytics, like yeah. analytics at scale. So the fact that we had it ready means that we have a lot to build on instead of starting from scratch and that has been valuable. Now, I would say one of the top questions I hear from customers is, well, but no matter what I do with data management, at some point I'm going to take the question and the instructions and the grounding information and I'm going to send it to Azure OpenAI. So you're going to see the data. Yep. Are you going to train on that? Are you going to learn from it and whatnot? And uh, we made it a point to have a very short and crisp answer, which is no. We don't train on customer data. We don't learn from that data. We don't use it to improve the models. We, we, in fact, we don't keep it. I mean, we only keep it for a little bit uh, for responsible AI reasons. Like we do, we don't always do all the responsible AI kind of validations synchronously. So sometimes we keep it for a little bit to do that, but we don't keep any of the data long-term and we don't train on it, anything like that. So that's a, uh, Hopefully that removes one degree of concern from customers asking fair questions around, well, what are you going to do with the, my business questions that uh, are going into the model? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a pretty, pretty clear answer. No, I, I've heard uh, Satya talk a lot about responsibility and responsible AI. Yeah. Can you talk to the audience a little bit about responsible AI and what the framework is for thinking about that? Yeah, of course. So well, one thing that I I appreciate that Microsoft did early. Uh, it's like work on a framework for this because you, know, you can kind of separate the the question of hey, like, can we all agree that we need to make sure we're going to do a good job in being responsible and making good use of this? And then, yeah, everybody will say yes, uh, but but then yeah. but then you don't want uneven judgment applied to this. You want a framework that we can all use, we can all think about and apply consistently. And that has been something that Microsoft, I feel. But the, micro, the folks at Microsoft working on responsible AI, they've done a great job at. Like they, they define this thing called the kind of open AI principles that include things like you know open AI system, or not open AI sorry, AI systems that need to be you know transparent and uh, they have to account for inclusiveness and have, need to be fair. And uh, and then there is like an oper operationalization framework for that. Like how do you bring this to practice? Where I feel that all the work that they did up front of that, up front on that, helped kind of raise the bar for everyone. So, so this is, you know, a group of people thought about this very deeply, uh, used a lot of experiences. I mean, we've made our own kind of number of mistakes, and, you know, learned from that. And all of that accrues in, the, in this kind of AI principles work. And then this is something that everybody like inside Microsoft is very aware of. So, so, you know, even, you know, sometimes we'll do things like we'll deliberately slow down and do things like, hey, uh, regular apps, we would have just shipped. But uh, the apps that are AI powered require a different level of um, due diligence. So we will go through extra steps to do, you know, to validate that as well. Yeah. Um, and I would say, lastly, you know, we, um, you know, Microsoft is a company that both ships products that are ready for end users to use, but also we are a platform for others to build their own uh, things. So we're doing all the all we can to make sure that the things we learn, learn and the tools that we build are available to developers, so they can also not start from scratch. You know, you can always say, hey, here's an evaluation system. And that is certainly important. But you also need the, this frame of, well, like, how does this fit uh, in the, kind of the rules of engagement that society is constructing around this? And do we have a way to describe it? And um, so I feel that whole stack that includes technical pieces, but also policy position is very important in that sense. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Well, before I, I switch gears and ask you another personal question about, about your experience and your career, is there any Microsoft Alpha that you can share with us, things that are coming out that you can share on the show? Uh, so, so one thing I'll share is, so I mentioned before, going to production and scale has been a thing these days. And part of that is you know, uh, customers start with small solutions and then they scale it and they realize, hey, I want 
all of my knowledge available to these systems. Not, I don't want to pick and choose. A challenge with that is, well, like then you make these giant databases, like you know, retrieval systems or, or vector systems that are they can get expensive. One of the things we've been doing is we've been working hard on the very much state-of-the-art systems for how do we scale these to remove all these concerns around the cost of scale. And uh, you'll see us like very soon talk about a complete shift in in the level of scale you can uh, achieve with our uh, retrieval systems for generative AI apps and a huge improvement in economics. Because in the end, like what I want to make sure is that no one ends up not bringing data into the picture because of the economics of it. Like, you know, these solutions are going to be great when all data is accessible and we are in the business of enabling developers to to bring all of their data in and not have to deal with, well, let's cost optimize this because if not, this or that is not going to be practical. So you'll see a huge acceleration on that, which is very much related to this wave of applications that are now going to production. Yeah, it goes back to your remove friction. That's right. And just, you know, that's the kind of removal of friction around cost. So, you know, as a distinguished engineer, you sit, you know, there's a very small group of you at the company. And so I wonder, like, as you think about the past career, who are the people that have influenced you? Who are the mentors along the way in the company that come to mind as really influential? Um, I, I can think of a few, some more formally, my mentors, some more informally, but I'll, so I'll give, so one person, for example, that comes to mind is I was, you know, maybe a year or two into Microsoft and the people that own the C-sharp programming language were like, hey, we're going to work on Link, language integrated query, which is, you know, it was a thing a long time ago. Now we all take it for granted in the language. And uh, Anders Helsberg, who was, his, was the chief designer of C-sharp and TypeScript, was a uh, running point in that. I mean, he owned the language. And uh, because it was a database thing, I was involved in that. So I got to watch from the same meeting room for, you know, maybe several months how Anders ran the design effort for, in that case, for language integrated query in C Sharp. And it was so inspiring. I mean, first, this is one of the things you got to love about Microsoft is like you can, I mean, he's just there in some office. You can go see <laughs> Anders or, or, you know, similarly, there are multiple Turing Award winners at Microsoft. You can go find them. So yeah, that's, that's amazing. I mean, I've always found this fascinating. And, and I learned from that, I mean, not only a lot of technical details, but also, how do you conduct a design exercise of that ambition that is going to touch these many developers in that case? Uh, how do you involve all the experts in your team? How do you run a right cadence? How do you make decisions? And uh, I still take a lot of those patterns with me uh, when I run my design meetings or when I you know, have to make technical choices and things like that. So maybe that's both an example, Anders Helsberg, but also I would say in general, um, you know, some of these companies have these folks working there that you get to meet that are, it's just fascinating to just be in the room with them. Yeah, I mean, that's really amazing. Well, I always like to end the show by asking the same question, and that is, in two words, can you describe your vision of the future of work, the future of AI? You, then you can elaborate, but try to limit it to two words. What would those two words be? So I, I would try something like, go farther. Go farther. Uh, and uh, you know, the reason why is like I'm not a marketing person. I, I don't understand many of the choices that we make. But I, whoever coined Copilot as the thing for Microsoft, they had a very good day. Like I, I that's exactly how I think about this current wave of technology. Is they are this kind of extension of your brain that can help you do things that it would have maybe been practical to do otherwise. And uh, but that's the, while still factoring kind of human ingenuity in the picture. So when I think about the opportunity for the systems to help us, you know, further science past into topics of science that maybe is too hard for people alone to think about, uh, but maybe the partnership of people and these systems can tackle it. And, you know, science uh, can span anywhere from kind of fundamental questions for us to understand where we come from and, and uh, how, how we work all the way to very practical questions like, you know, how do we help uh, people's health and, and things like that. And I think this is a wide spectrum of opportunity there that um, I I strongly believe we can go farther in those with this kind of combination of people and technology. I love that optimistic view of it. It's like having your partner there with you, helping you along the way and pushing all sorts of things, communities, society, organizations, businesses. It's a really optimistic perspective. Pablo, thank you so much for being on the show. It was really great talking with you. And I think the audience got a lot out of it. And I would love to have you back at some point. So thank you. Yeah, sounds great. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed the show, the show as well. Thanks. That's a wrap. 
Thanks for tuning in. Such a pleasure to have Pablo as our guest on today's episode. Pablo's passion for Gen AI and his key position at Microsoft leading Azure AI Search shed light on some of the most innovative aspects of this emerging technology. If you want to learn more about Pablo, you can find him on LinkedIn. If you're interested in how he thinks about Gen AI and Search, definitely connect with him and keep up with his posts and activities online. I continue to be amazed by the guests we've had on the show, and I'm excited about the ones joining us in the near future. I truly appreciate you spending your time with us. Thank you for listening to this episode, and don't forget to subscribe to the Shift AI podcast for more exciting interviews and the Simply Augmented AI weekly newsletter for updates on how AI can help scale your business. The Shift AI podcast is presented by Simply Augmented and syndicated by GeekWire. We are grateful to have the show sponsored by CIBC Innovation Bank, as well as Simply Augmented. Our theme music was created by Dave Angel.